everyone. If we're ready to get started. Welcome, good evening everyone, to the next session, which is what is the best response to the next global pandemic? My name is Peggy Clark. I'm the Vice President of Policy Programs at the Aspen Institute. And I'm so pleased to have you all with us this evening. This is an important topic. And you are going to hear from some fascinating colleagues who each have quite distinct perspectives on this, on this issue. So thanks very much for coming tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening. Reggie Van Lee will be our moderator. He's the Executive Vice President with Booz Allen Hamilton where he leads Booz Allen's public health and not-for-profit businesses. Reggie has an interesting background, which I don't have the time to do justice to, but um, he's a trustee of the Studio Museum of Harlem. President Obama appointed Van Lee to the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities, and he was one of the founding members of the Clinton Global Initiative. And he is a, a leading uh, thinker on global health issues, so we're so pleased to have him moderate the panel tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you. So after that introduction, I'm bound to disappoint you, so I apologize in advance, but mm. we're happy to be here. We've had some time to chat before, and we actually had a call last week, and we said if this discussion tonight could be as interesting as that call, we think you'll find it really interesting. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, then I'll ask each of them to just give a few minutes on their perspective on this topic, and in particular, why are they here today, and what do they have to add to this discussion to cause you to really want to hear what they have to say. So we'll start with Richard. Great. Uh, I'm Rich Besser. I'm the senior health and medical editor at ABC News. Uh, before that, I, I spent most of my career at the Centers for Disease Control as an infectious disease epidemiologist. And I was the acting director of CDC when the pandemic started uh, a year ago. Uh, and I'm Nigel Crisp. I'm an independent member of the House of Lords in the UK. And before that, I was for six years chief executive of the NHS in England, but also um, permanent secretary of the Department of Health. I'm uh, Nathan Wolf, and I'm uh, the Lori Loki visiting professor of human biology at Stanford University. And I run a hybrid company called Global Viral Forecasting, uh, whose mission is to detect pandemics early and try to catch them before they spread. Good. It's interesting being the moderator, you never really know when you are allowed to have a point of view versus just ask good questions to smart people. But my colleagues have allowed me to offer a perspective. So before they give their views, I just wanted to give a quick perspective. It's clear that this topic of pandemic is an important one. It's also clear that historically people have felt it is the government's role to have a leading role in driving these solutions and these issues. But certainly we've experienced the need for the private sector, the public sector, and what we may call the civil sector, to work in some sort of collaboration to resolve these sort of issues. So I think that's one of the topics we'll talk about. The challenge there is those three sectors, private, public, and civil, are so different in their skill sets, so different in their mindset, so different in the perspective they bring to the table, that while collaboration is the thing that needs to happen, oftentimes it's very difficult to happen. So the real question is how do you get beyond your natural inclinations to rise to the occasion of a pandemic and have all the stakeholders to work together in the right sort of way with the right sort of roles. The H1N1 experience uh, taught us a lot, but of course did not teach us, every, teach us everything. So what we want to hear today is, if we had it to do again, as we look to future pandemics, not with excitement, but with trepidation, how do we think about creating the preparedness and planning for those that is necessary? So Richard, you can start. Great. Uh, so yeah, I want to give my, my perspective from my experience with, with H1N1. Um, and take you back to January of, of last year uh, when, the, uh, uh, when President Obama was sworn in. I was asked to be the acting director of, of CDC. And so I, uh, I made my pilgrimage to Washington to meet with people in the department to find out what did they think about CDC and what did we need to do. And so I met with the, the, the uh, chief of staff in, in Health and Human Services and uh, said, well, what do you think needs to happen at CDC? Minor changes? major changes or stabilization. And I'm thinking it's gonna be minor changes. Uh, and uh, the chief of staff looked at me and said, major changes. And I said, why? And he said, well, for too long, you've invested too much money in preparing for low probability, high consequence events. And you haven't spent enough money on those things that are causing uh, death and disability right now. 
<clears throat> and I said, like what? He said, well, it's too much on terrorism preparedness, pandemic preparedness. Uh, those things you know, uh, are not causing the harm that these other diseases are. And I said, why in public health do we have to have a trade-off uh, between addressing those issues of chronic disease that are occurring every day and being prepared for something that could be absolutely devastating? Um, and that was my, uh, my start as, as director of CDC. And then it was four months later uh, that the pandemic hit. And I think the, the viewpoint of those in the department changed very dramatically about the importance of pandemic preparedness. Let, let me um, say two things from two sort of different perspectives, as it were, uh, of, of the most recent stuff that I've been doing is working on global health and particularly working in Africa. And the big thing that hits me all the time is how interdependent we are. You know? It's no longer good enough to be thinking about health in terms of just the UK. And we're interdependent in terms of disease. Um, in the 14th century, I think the Black Death took three winters to get across Europe. Uh, more recently, SARS took three days to get around the world, didn't it? Um, we're interdependent on all the stuff like climate change. We're interdependent in terms of the resources. We use the same staff, we use the same medicines. We're interdependent now, I guess, in the same knowledge systems. So there's a whole range of ways in which we uh, need to be thinking about um, the preparedness of other countries for pandemics, the fact that you actually need strong health systems in some of the weakest countries of the world to stop things developing to a stage where they then come and get us in our more comfortable countries around the world. So that's one theme that I think we might explore, which is that sort of interdependentness and, and the fact that actually it's important to me that there is a good, strong health system in some of the poorest countries of the world. Uh, the second bit, actually, is my, you know, to go back five years, is that I ran the NHS and, and was permanent secretary of the Department of Health from 2000 to 2006. And of course, we were deeply into preparing for um, uh, pandemics and lots of other things as well. Um, and I guess two themes that, that, that might just be interesting to explore a bit is, is one is how politicians understand what scientists are saying to them. Um, because we had some of the best scientists in the world, but we had some good politicians too. And you know that with politicians, naturally, timescales are short, aren't they? And you want to know, well, is this stuff going to come and get us? You know, how are we going to deal with it? All these sort of questions. So how do you manage that? But the other thing, which is perhaps less obvious to, to those of you in America, is that in the UK, we're very near other countries. Uh, and so the feedback loop about how populations behave is not just about how the Brits behave, it's about how the French behave and how the Germans behave. And it's interesting for us in the UK, we had to prepare for if the French adopted some different approach to the pandemic, how were we going to respond? You know, if they closed their... Uh, there, there was a particular point where they bought an awful lot of face masks. Should we go and buy face masks? You know, these were a, another set of, you know. Now, all of you understand the Brits and the French are always fighting because we've been doing that for centuries. Um, so it's, it just adds another dimension to, to thinking about this in, in the sort of non-scientific element. Well, I think in addition to sort of interdependence, one of the things that I think is very important to think about is uh, interconnectivity and just the level of connectivity that we have as a human population. Um, some of the work that we do is, is actually going to some of the most remote locations in the world, looking for regions that are sort of these really biodiversity hotspots, these viral hotspots, if you will, places where pandemics are likely to be born. And what I find is no matter where we get, the end of the road, somewhere in Congo, um, these are places that are connected. Uh, we once lived in a world where diseases would, you know, perhaps cross over from uh, animals into humans who were hunting or butchering, uh, and these things would be local. That situation is no longer. We have a situation where humans and animals are moving across borders. Uh, if you look at the sort of differences in flights between, say, the 1950s and 60s and the flights now, you see basically it's just spaghetti. We are completely one single village when it comes to these microorganisms. Um, and I think the question that was posed was posed sort of an interesting way, which is how can we best respond to the next global pandemic? Uh, and I think just to echo some of, the, some of the comments you've heard so far, I think the best way that we can respond to the next global pandemic is actually not to let it to occur. In other words, to figure out what are the factors associated with how these pandemics are born 
to, to go out and create global detection systems where we can catch them early and to actually work to move the science forward. Uh, this is a very similar situation in my mind where we sat with regards to individual level medicine 20 or 30 years ago where the best way you could deal with this was you would go to your cardiologist and they would say, okay, you have family history of heart disease and high blood pressure, but you know, at the end of the day, if you have a heart attack, we know how to do, um, you know, we know how to, how to do surgery to somehow repair the damage. And that's where we are with regards to pandemics now. We need a major paradigm shift in how we think about these things. And we need to be willing to take on some of the difficult questions that are out there and say, okay, how are viruses gonna evolve? And how can we find a virus that's jumped over and know whether this is something which is gonna spread? And how can we detect these things before they hit the global stage? Because by that point, it's like you know, the pack a day smoker for 20 years, it's gonna be too late and it's gonna be too expensive to deal with. Good. So speaking of questions, Fantastic. I'm going to ask each of our panelists one question, but I'd like very much then to move to your questions. If you don't have them, I have some tough ones, but hopefully you'll have some uh, that are better than mine. So I'll start with Richard. It's clear in any issue, there's always an issue of leadership. And around this notion of pandemic planning and response, what do you see as the challenges of leadership? What are the skills and qualities that we need in leaders? How do we really get this addressed at the top in the right way? Uh, you know, reflecting back again on, on some of the leadership challenges that, that occurred during this pandemic, um, some that are U.S. specific, um, but there are, there are, I think, lessons learned for planning for the next pandemic. Uh, when this pandemic hit, it was during a period of political transition. Uh, we did not have a secretary of health. We did not have deputy secretaries, assistant secretaries. None of the structure was in place that's uh, very important for establishing policy moving forward. Um, and there were pluses and minuses to this. Uh, I remember during the pandemic, we had a visit from, uh, from uh, an ambassador who said, well, you know, things are going pretty well. CDC is moving very fast. What do you view as one of the success factors? And I said, well, we don't have a secretary. And uh, uh, he said, you know, I don't think I'd lead with that as, uh, as your comment in general. But my point was that, that um, in our system of government, there's a separation between technical and political. Um, and uh, the political level um, doesn't have the scientific expertise, but is very necessary for making some of the decisions. And what I found was very important during this pandemic was um, uh, really the ability to lead across organizations that, you, that don't report to you. And this pertains to a domestic situation as well as a global situation. Um, you're, you're not gonna ever be in a situation with a pandemic where there's line authority on much of, of anything. Uh, the decisions you make as a country uh, have great impact on other countries uh, around you. And the way to be successful in that situation is through, is through influence and uh, really being vested, uh, uh, invested in the success of those uh, around you. Um, and uh, there are different schools of, of training around that. Uh, a lot of us at CDC went through a program at Harvard in something called Meta Leadership, which is really focused on uh, this approach of leading, uh, leading up, leading down, leading across, uh, where there's not that line of authority. And it was, I think, very effective during, uh, during this pandemic. Uh, I, uh, was in contact uh, very closely with the leaders in Canada and Mexico when the pandemic was starting. And we developed very close relationship and a re relationship of respect and trust so that the investigation that was going on in Mexico, uh, we could provide resources in a way that was very respectful of their mm -hmm. health system. Um, and it could be done in a trilateral way. Uh, and information could be shared in a very open way. I think it's a theme that we're gonna talk about a lot, but. If there's not that open sharing of information, uh, uh, you know, if you haven't been able to prevent the pandemic, you got to know when it's coming quickly. If you're going to have, uh, if if you're going to have uh, an, an ability to slow it down or, or or stop it, and and the ability to have leaders who have relationships across uh, different countries who can work effectively in that domain is is really critical. Good, good. So I, I was going to ask Nigel a question, but since you brought up information sharing. Nathan, in your experience, how do you make that happen? How do you protect that information that you want to hold close versus know that information that you disseminate and move the, the issue ahead? Well, I mean, one of the things that I can say is that we, 
exist in this incredible new world where data is so plentiful. I mean, there, there's a completely new way of approaching epidemiology uh, that some of my colleagues are calling digital epidemiology. And we've now sort of, our, our, our biggest recent hire was actually a computer scientist, believe it or not. And so we're going to be in a world where we'll have to do the sort of traditional surveillance that we all grew up on, actually going and doing the hard work in these countries around the world and seeing what actually is happening with people who are getting sick. But on the other hand, there are these incredibly exciting things that are going on. Just to give you some examples, uh, Google flu trends is something that, that, that some of you may be familiar with. And basically, the idea is simply to look at how people are searching and to see patterns in search that may indicate what's going on with flu. And what they were able to do by doing this, and Google actually did this, is they were able to actually um, get a little bit ahead of CDC in terms of, of actually predicting what was going to happen in seasonal flu. Because when people get sick, they suddenly are going to search on certain terms like headache and, and these particular terms. Um, and while these you know, are just sort of moving to the rest of the world, there's going to be a huge data influx. And it's not just going to be sort of the traditional data. Um, but there's sort of another angle, which I think is what you're getting to, which is how do we transcend these issues of uh, fears of biopiracy? These are very real fears. If you take a look, there was a, a substantive um, problem that we've had um, in terms of creating vaccines. The way that seasonal flu vaccines are created is by taking uh, influenza varieties that are in different parts of the world and bringing them together and actually predicting the likely trajectory that seasonal flu is going to take and then actually averaging it and creating a vaccine. Well, if certain people are not, you know, in countries are not willing to provide vaccines, whether it be for seasonal flu or pandemic flu, we run into major problems. And it's very challenging to think about how you can address this. For us, the solution has been sort of long-term scientific engagement. And I think this is an approach that's been taken by the MRC, by the CDC. Um, and this is something front and center for, you know, our organization, Global Viral Forecasting, which is to work for long periods of time with scientists in these countries to develop expertise. You know, if it's a place like Cameroon, you may need to put in place a liquid nitro nitrogen generator so people can preserve specimens. If it's a place like China, you may take off the table what's going to happen to specimens eventually and just say, hey, these are important specimens to get. Let's work together to get them. In the future, we can decide what to do with them. We'll try to analyze them here to start with. But and at the end of the day, once you've established long-term collaborative teams, and invested over the long haul, you change the nature of the way that people are thinking about this. So in some ways, it's old-fashioned diplomacy, but applied to science, applied to public health. And I think we, as scientists, need to take lessons from the diplomats in terms of how we actually approach these kinds of issues. We have to be sensitive. Good. Nigel, in your book, you emphasize the need mm -hmm. for leaders to think in terms of systems as opposed to individual nodes of the network. And it goes back to our interdependence argument. But how do you organize, manage this broad set of stakeholders? How do you determine who are the critical stakeholders to be involved, the right roles they play, and keep them engaged given the different incentive structures they operate under? Well, I don't think there's an, an easy answer to that. Um, I think part of it is what both colleagues have been talking about, which is actually being prepared, isn't it? It's actually having the relationships already so that when you speak to the French counterpart or whatever, you, you know each other and you, you have a chance to, to, to have that dialogue. And to have been thinking very wide about who the people are you have to talk to. Um, we started off in the, I mean, actually very conveniently for this panel, um, the independent review of the, um, of the pandemic um, in the UK was um, published last week. So I can piggyback on the findings of that. Um, uh, real data? You're going to bring real data to the discussion? Sorry? You're bringing real data to the discussion? Well, I mean... That's not fair. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I apologize for that. But, uh, um, but the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is we have developed from actually talking to a relatively smallish group of people to actually, you know, you need to talk to the press, make sure that you've got the relationships with the press so that you're talking to the public in that way. You've got to talk to the group of scientists. Um, but actually, you have to talk much wider than that. You have to talk to local authorities. You have to talk to your neighbors and so on and gradually increase that. One of the recommendations that's come out of this review is that we have in the UK, and I'm sure you have here the equivalent of uh, two scientific committees, actually, who actually look at the science, look at the evidence, and then feed it on to... Uh, those of us who are in the, in the uh, policy-making uh, and, and political environment. Um, and that's great, 
You know, that, that, that's, a, that's a good way of doing it. But one of the recommendations was that at the same time of doing that, we should also be providing that information to other respected scientists who weren't in the system. You know, this is about transparency. Mm -hmm. This is about making sure that you don't actually get into the position that you're listening to your, you know, I'm a layman in, in this context, uh, and, and you're listening to your scientists, but actually there's some other scientist from somewhere else who's saying, you're getting it all wrong, and he's saying that in the press or whatever. So how do you make sure that you're trying to share information with people like that? Because we are all so completely connected up. Um, and I think that same sort of approach needs to be taken uh, with other groups of people. I mean, the private sector are fantastically important as employers. Happily, this time around, we didn't have to think about um, uh, the prioritization of different, well, we did thought about, we didn't have to put it in practice, the prioritization of, uh, you know, transport of food and transport of, you know, all the sort of things around the country if we were really getting into a situation where we were trying to, you know, not get people to move around too much and, and, and getting lots of deaths and so on. So it's a very wide group of people uh, that you have to do, and the watchword has just to be transparency. Uh, but but while can. philosophically that makes sense, the, yeah. the practical challenge in, in the scientific community, for example, mm -hmm. I want to be the one who discovered this, mm -hmm. and I want the credit for it. How do you get scientists to share this mm -hmm. information? And then even broader, as you go into the government sector or the private sector, how do you really, though mm -hmm. we philosophically all get it, when it comes to my turn to share, I want everyone else to share, but I don't want to share. How do you mm -hmm. break through that? And any of you can answer that. Yeah, I do. Uh, I mean, I think perhaps part of it is where do you set the bar? And I'm, I'm a big fan of these things like the X Prize. Mm -hmm. And I mean, really, what is the holy grail? And the holy grail should, for scientists should start moving from something like, um, you know, very exciting discoveries, discover the origin of a virus or sort of identify a virus first to actually, you know, I think the thing that should excite scientists is, is can you actually you know, predict something. And I think that um, when you talk about sort of public-private issues, this has very much been in the sphere of, of government historically, and I think it will continue to be so, but um, I mean, and I've sort of voted with my feet in terms of, you know, I still have an academic appointment, but I've left to start an independent organization. And I really wonder what will be the key data sources that will lead to the ultimate ability to predict these things. And I think they'll be unexpected, and it'll be a combination of sort of traditional surveillance, but also scraping the web for every sort of foreign language news source on a pandemic and outbreak, okay? But then it'll have to be ground truthed with actual information from the field. Or maybe it'll be scanning in detailed data that comes out of Facebook and people saying, oh, I'm not feeling well or I am feeling well. And it'll be sort of like layers of information. What are people searching in Google? What are people saying on Twitter? Um, what are people buying in terms of uh, over-the-counter drugs and, and pharmaceuticals in, in uh, pharmacies combined with sort of these traditional data sources? I think we're going to have to involve information technology. I think we're going to have to involve a whole range of private partners that we've never really thought we could involve. And fortunately, we exist in this world that sort of the flip side of the world is, is really the, one of the most dangerous worlds we've ever existed in with regards to the probability of a devastating global pandemic. On the other hand, the same interconnectivity that leads to that also creates this capacity to share information, mm -hmm. almost a natural capacity to share information, and people are paying for information in such a way that I think there'll be a whole different set of incentives that will come to bear. Some of them will be private you know, private um, sort of segment incentives that'll come where people will actually, by being able to more effectively predict these things, they'll be able to sell the data in such a way that'll be useful for a reinsurance company or useful for a hedge fund. And there's a group of us that are really trying to work to mash up the data in such a way that we can come up with these kinds of systems. Yeah, can, can, can I come in on this as well? Because I, I think there are two, there's two different paces here. There's the pre-pandemic pace mm -hmm. when What's being talked about here is, is what happens. And, and actually, you want people to be individual as well, don't you? You want people to be going down their particular route. But there's the point at which actually the pandemic is about to be declared or you, know, you, mm. you see it coming when actually you want everyone to be pulling together. And I think that does change yeah. the climate considerably. And I think there's another point which I suspect you know more about than we do, Reggie, which, which is the point that actually there's a big issue of trust involved here, isn't there? You know, how do you maintain trust across that group of scientists, but actually across the wider community? 
why are they going to trust us? You know, because actually, you know that governments haven't always been trustworthy. Mm -hmm. I want to yeah. come in mm -hmm. on that as well. Yeah. I, I, th mm. I think that um, one of the mm. things that was demonstrated with this pandemic mm. um, was a very rapid sharing of viruses and mm. of sequences and mm. information out there, and it you know it led to some competition, but it was it was information in the public domain. Sequences were put up you know, mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. Mexico was very quickly sending specimens to, to other countries. CDC was sending viral isolates around the world, as, as was Canada. And I think that uh, when you have a pandemic occurring, uh, getting that rapid spread of, of strains allows you know, scientific entrepreneurs around the world to mm -hmm. use what their, their their skills to come up with newer, faster diagnostic tests, new approaches to treatment, all kinds of things. And, and uh, the countries that did that, I mean, Mexico in particular, uh, mm -hmm. really was, was, mm -hmm. uh, was praised in a big way and compared and contrasted with SARS in China and how long it took there for information mm -hmm. to get out. Yeah, and so I, I think that there are, really are those two phases of how do you detect it early and what are the data sources, but once it's happened, how do you, how do you prevent the, the traditional scientific approach of, you know, we want to keep this data because we're going to publish it, and it's really important for us to, to keep it close. And Nigel makes the, the critical point, which he knew I would resonate with, this notion of trust. What we mm -hmm. find is, by definition, people with different backgrounds have some distrust around each other. Yeah. And if you wait until the moment of the issue, then I certainly distrust your motives as to why you're involved in the issue. So there's some work that has to happen before that. There's some building of relationships, some interactions, some collaborations, perhaps on simple issues that aren't controversial, so that I begin mm. to have some trust with the people so that when the difficult issues come, then I'm prepared to deal with them. Yeah. On that topic of trust, then I'm going to turn to the audience for questions. If you look at the H1N1 experience in America, there are at least two schools of thought. One says it was much ado about, not nothing, but much ado about more than it needed to be, that there was this, you know, mass confusion and alarm and at the end of the day and we have the stats that actually this past year there have been less deaths from flu than in previous years period h1 or other other diseases so some could say what was the hullabaloo about others say had we not done that then perhaps there would have been an issue and we would have been blamed for not having warned the public it goes back to the trust again so as we look back on what happened and your experiences even over in the uk how might we how should we going forward deal with the whole notion of public trust, sharing of information, messaging around pandemics? Yeah, I, I think that um, with, with, whenever there's a, an outbreak or an event or emergency, you, you do a review and, and come up with lessons learned. And, and one of the takeaways from this was the, uh, on the US side, was the incredible importance of communication. And uh, we took a strategy at CDC that we would not turn down a single interview, that we would do daily briefings, mm -hmm that we would tell the public what we knew when we knew it um, and what we were doing to find out information. And, and the strategy of why we were being so aggressive up front when you don't know whether this is going to be a 1918 pandemic or something milder. Um, and the, we look, we're looking at polling data out of Harvard. We used their, their uh, public polling to see what did the public know, what were the areas of confusion. Uh, and there was actually incredibly high trust, about 85% trust in government which is like never heard of during the early part of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, it shifted gears um, during the vaccine phase uh, when the promise of vaccine for September went to October to November to December. But the early period where mm -hmm. there was great uncertainty as to whether this was what was being seen in Mexico, which was a highly fatal uh, pneumonia, hospitals filled and overflowing, to what it became, which was a, a much milder pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, I, I hope one of the lessons learned is that there has to be incredible transparency around information and what you know. And, you know, if, if you're finding out it's not so severe, you got to be saying that. And if you're finding out the vaccine's going to be coming a little later, you better say it and you better say it fast or you're going to lose that trust. And once you lose that mm -hmm. element of trust, uh, you really can't get it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think we had the same sort of pattern, actually, because there were hiccups about the availability of the vaccine, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. which was exactly the same time scale. And, and therefore, you start to get these, these, these questions rising. I think uh, th there's also the point that, 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 that Reggie made, which is who's telling you? Uh, and if there, are more than, if there are voices in 
at least not too suspiciously in Concord, you know, why have they sold out and they're speaking with the government? You know, but, but we've had the same issue in the UK with vaccines um, about, um, you know, whether or not people trust the vaccines. And I think there's some interesting le lessons to learn from there. But this report that came out last week uh, also used another thing, which was actually about language. You know, we talked about communication, but it's actually also about language. And the two examples they picked out were they picked out um, uh, the projections from the scientists, which were repeated by the government, which was the worst possible case. You know, in the worst possible case, there will be this many deaths. Um, but actually, it wasn't just the worst possible case. It was the combination of the worst assessment of what might happen at various stages. So it was the worst, worst. So it was a very unlikely case. You know? And the, it, they were saying, well, should we be talking about what we think the likely case is, you know, which is a more complex one? And there was another one, which to scientists may be very obvious, which is the containment phase. Now, the containment phase, the public saw as, so that's the end of it, as opposed to a slowing of the, or, or a containment of the spread. You know? So there are some language issues in this as well, which were being fed back into us about how we did that as part of the communication. Yeah. I mean, what, what I might add to that, um, and just sort of echoes these comments, is there's, for me, the concept of risk literacy. You know, scientific yeah. literacy is a wonderful objective, and it takes many, many years, and we should all be pushing for it. Risk literacy is a much more specific thing that you could probably teach in a semester in high school. There are some profound misconceptions um, that are incredibly common about this, about this particular pandemic. I mean, so when we think about these pandemics, there's two major variables that are most important. How deadly is it and how easy is it from, for it to spread from one person to another? And believe it or not, it's the, the transmissibility element that in some ways is most frightening from an epidemiological perspective, right? So if you had a little dial and you could turn up the deadliness of this virus, okay, its capacity to spread was so profound that had you turned it up even a little bit, you would have been talking about dramatic, dramatic deaths on the planet. Okay, so I think the notion somehow that we had misplaced energy spent on this, we shouldn't have focused on it, or, or frankly, that we did much to control its spread, I think are illusions that we all harbor. This is a virus that went from not being in human populations to within a year affecting perhaps over 10% of the human population. That is an incredibly profound and important biological event. And the notion that we would somehow blame public health officials for following it is like you know, somehow crucifying a meteorologist for following a hurricane that somehow turns course at the end and doesn't hit land. No, the idea is we're going to have more and more of these. And what we need to do is find the language where we can talk to people appropriately, which I think you know, is really important. And also increase their capacity to understand what are the variables, how do probabilities work, how do statistics work, what are the factors of pandemics that can really make them dangerous. I mean, I think if anything, we failed in this. Um, we got lucky. Nature handed us a virus that wasn't deadly. That's basically it, <clears throat> full stop. Had nothing to do with vaccines or containment or any of that. Um, and people miss that. Somehow they're like, you over responded. And it's like, no, honestly, we didn't do enough. And the thing, honestly, and there's still, we don't really know. H1N1 is still out there. The capacity this virus may have, these things have the capacity to mutate, to recombine. You know, this thing could end up, I mean, one of the things we do, believe it or not, is we follow the old bird flu, H5N1, the people who are getting this virus, because the idea is as H1 is spread around the world, if these viruses have the capacity to sort of recombine or form these mosaics, which they can do, you could end up with a virus that had the deadliness of bird flu, but the ability to spread that H1N1 had. Okay, so these are gonna be a part of our life, and we're gonna, we are gonna need to develop a way to communicate about them. Um, and to make sure that the public is, I mean, and, and maybe there are parallel issues with terrorism. I, I can't you know, fully comment on that. It's, it's a hard task, yeah. Yeah. but we're gonna have to get there because the notion that we screwed up and over responding to me on this thing, I think is from my perspective, totally wrong. I, I think your point about um, risk literacy is, is critically important. And uh, I think I've been involved in three panels, either moderating or, or other over the past two months. And that issue has come up. And, uh, George Church, uh, geneticist mm -hmm. at Harvard, his solution is that we should stop teaching calculus in high school and replace it with probability and statistics. Because that's here, something here. you can use for your entire life, regardless of what field you go into, Absolutely. just to understand the, the basics, uh, things you encounter every day in, in your life. Um, every day when I'm on television, I'm trying to communicate the issue of risk. Yeah. It is brutally hard to, to distill that down in a way that, that people can understand. So let's hear from you. Questions? Here? 
Uh, I've been involved in some uh, exercises in Latin America on pandemic disease. I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm a mathematician. And I was supporting these things with mathematical models. But I, I had an observation, I'd like to get some reactions. Um, in half a dozen countries in Latin America, the ministries of health themselves uh, are filled with competent professional people but the structure of the ministry is completely dysfunctional. It's not the individuals, it's the, the way that people are appointed by, for political reasons, um, they aren't paid enough, they have to respond to political parties, um, and they're completely stovepiped. In order for a ministry mm -hmm. official on the ground to talk to the police, he has to communicate all the way up his ministry who talks to the Ministry of Interior, and that goes all the way back down to the local police. And that's nuts. It takes weeks when you have hours to deal with. And we saw um, good people completely flummoxed by their social structures that they have. Mm -hmm. And I, I came to the conclusion that, that this is actually a health problem, that we, unless we can help these countries straighten out their structural problems. No matter how well-educated their doctors are, they won't be able to cope with a pandemic. Reactions? Well, I, I have a lot of sympathy with the, with the point that you're making on, 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 on two levels. Firstly, this is a government issue, not a health department issue. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, again, my country. Um, our health people linked into, into the same structure that we use for terrorism or any other major incident, um, because actually you're all involved. It's local government, national government, education, media, the, the whole lot. So, so that, that's actually crucial. I think, you, I, th I think you're right that there is a big um, issue about um, government structures and mentalities about government, which is one of the issues that is as important in global health you know, it tends to be described as governance and, uh, uh, and so on, uh, as almost anything else. I mean, I work a lot in Africa, and a lot of my interest is about getting more health workers trained and the right health workers trained for Africa. Now, the trouble is the health minister is over here and the education minister is over here. You know, these sort of structures. Now, having said all of that, that's not unknown in our countries either. <laughs> you know, we don't join, you know, joining up government is a, is a lovely expression and it is difficult to say. But I do think there's, there's, there's probably quite an important focus around this and it's part of the point that I was saying earlier on about our interdependence that actually um, uh, 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 as, as Nathan has said you know it's important to know what's going on in the Congo um, uh, uh, and, and, the, and that there's a health system in the Congo <laughs> um, but actually there's also the leadership <laughs> issue is, is something else that is extraordinarily important um, it's the other aspect of health literacy, of scientific literacy that's talked about, is actually political scientific literacy. Mm -hmm. um, and remembering again people's timescales and, 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 and thought patterns are different as politicians than they, than they are as scientists, because, uh, and they've been rewarded for those, those thought patterns. So it's quite difficult to bridge some of that. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, the issue of having systems that work is important, whether you're talking the United States or, or any country around the world. And, um, when I think of the challenge of, of preparing for the next pandemic, um, one of my takeaways from my years in government is that you can't look at it as something separate from the existing public health and health system. Yeah. You have to build Absolutely. systems mm -hmm. that, that are dealing with the day-to-day -day problems as well as being able to adapt and deal with the urgent and emergent problems. So in, in the a Latin American country over here, you want a surveillance system that's gonna be able to tell you what problems you're seeing today as well as being able to detect the, the new emerging problems that, uh, that the country may be facing and have a system that is working. Uh, if it's not working every day, it's not gonna work during a pandemic. And that goes for our country too. Over the past two years, mm -hmm. health departments have let go tens of thousands of talented workers because of the, you know, the, the loss of federal funding, loss of state funding. And you don't see it until there's, there's an emergency. And you know, you, the challenges that we face in this country are you know, 
they're on such a different scale when you're dealing with a country with even more limited resources. Before we go to the next question, which was here, this question prompts one of the questions I had here, which is, if you think about this issue of systems, and you think about as you have multiple stakeholders, there's some role and there's some set of capabilities required in order for them to play their role adequately. How do we best enable an equitable distribution of capabilities across all these various players so that a government has the level of capability, but also the private sector and the not-for-profit uh, civil sector? How do we manage that? My observation is that this is the sort of territory where it's learning by doing uh, rather than more than anything else, and that actually not just sort of pandemic practices, although I have to say within the Department of Health we did that, uh, and across government, you know, to, to, to try and play out what would happen. Um, uh, but it is also about, um, you know, the structures within society uh, and the fact that do the leaders talk, do people trust each other? Um, uh, you know, it's much easier to trust people you've met. <laughs> um, uh, and some of the capabilities are therefore going to be about um, people learning how to work together. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there are roles for institutions like Aspen and the new global health initiative that Peggy is going to lead, if I can give you a plug. <laughs> um, uh, I th and, and universities and, and, and other facilities to, to get that sort of dialogue going. Uh, and sometimes that gets missed out in the rush to get other things done, doesn't it? You know, so so I, I, I think it's time, I think it's relationships, I think it's people, I don't, and, and, and getting people to think in those sort of systems terms. I don't think there's anything easy about this. Um, except in as much as, you know, this sort of environment maybe does make it easier. Mm. So I'm sorry, you had a question here. Mm. Um, um, you know, one of the other aspects of dealing with a global pandemic is the technology of vaccination. And I think the reason the vaccines are delivered late is we have some pretty old-fashioned ways of creating vaccines, even for something like influenza, which we have to do every year. And do you think we're going to allow new technologies, such as, for example, DNA-based vaccines? Uh, which could be created much more easily and so forth, uh, to be part of the next response or are we going to take a long time? Or if we're dealing with a virus that's not influenza, something we're not very good at vaccinating it today. You know, there, there were a lot of discussions uh, during this pandemic as to whether even technologies such as adjuvants uh, should be used. Uh, things that you add to vaccine to be able to use a smaller amount of vaccine to be able to spread it to more people in this country and, and around the globe. Uh, these are things that were being used in many European countries, um, but are not licensed in the US. And uh, the decision was made, no, uh, that that wasn't the way to go. Um, there, there are trade-offs. You know, there's not a lot of trust in government, um, and there's not a lot of trust in vaccines. And the, the feeling was to go with a vaccine with a new technology in the middle of a pandemic, if there were some side effects, some problem, uh, that would really be uh, devastating in terms of the ability to vaccinate the, the country. There's been a lot of investment in new technologies. I, I think that there's not enough investment in new technologies, that uh, if we don't invest more, we're going to be faced with the, using the same technologies the next time a pandemic come, comes along. And there's so many exciting uh, uh, directions that are being pursued Towards, towards vaccination and, uh, and uh, you know, universal vaccines, vaccines that are, it, it's, it's just very exciting. You, I mean, you can, you can dive in because you know a lot about, more about this stuff than I do. It's very exciting. No, and I, I think also we should perhaps point to, I think there is gonna be an entire session on vaccines perhaps tomorrow as well, which um, will, would probably also be, you know, but I, I think it's, there is one of these ironies, which is uh, private sector for all it does to encourage all sorts of innovation uh, is not great when it comes to vaccines. If you talk about a statin drug that someone's going to take every day for the rest of their mm -hmm. life, you know, that's going to that's going to be much more profitable and a better investment from a private sector perspective than a vaccine, which is like a one one time shot. Uh, having said that, I think we're you know, we, we should we should be ages you know, we should be well ahead of where we are with regards to vaccines. Um, and, you know, fortunately, Gates Foundation has stepped up and, uh, you know, government spending is focused a little bit on vaccines, but I completely agree. And I think we could, you could imagine a future where we, um, 
where we have a much better sense of the diversity of viruses that are in our world. We have a combination of models and assays that we work on in laboratories that help us to sort those viruses out, the ones that are in humans and animals, and figure out which, which parts, of, which of those viruses are most likely to be important, and where we have sort of preventative panels of vaccines that are ready to go so when something happens, you can quickly ramp up. I mean, there's certainly, we should be able to do this scientifically. Uh, and I think there's, you know, some, some perhaps structural impediments with regards to private sector, uh, public sector issues, which are not letting us get there. But yeah, I mean, we're way behind where we should be. If we were where we should be with regards to vaccines compared to where we are with, um, say, lipid control, we'd live in a very different world. There's a mi microphone coming your way. <coughs> Um, could one of you address the question of antivirals, antiviral medication globally in terms of the pharmaceutical industry globally? Um, who should take responsibility for mobilizing the pharmaceutical industry globally? Who should financially support um, industry in countries like India where we know we can produce these medications much less expensively than in the United States? And how do you foresee this happening in anticipation of, of, a, pan, of a viral pandemic, for example? You know, I, I, one of my jobs at CDC, I was in charge of the strategic national stockpile. Um, and so we were dealing a lot with what products should be available in the event of various emergencies. Um, and as a nation, we made a decision to stockpile a lot of antiviral drugs, knowing pretty well that they're not all that effective uh, when it comes to, to influenza, but they're the best that you have and they can save lives in a, in a severe pandemic. The issues that Nathan raised about vaccines go for anti-infectives in general. Um, you know, we're approaching a, a world in which, uh, a, a post-antibiotic world, uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that you have centralization of, of, of all of these pharmaceutical companies. They're all merged together and they're looking for drugs that you're gonna use your entire life. They're not looking to develop antivirals, antibiotics, anti-infective uh, agents. And so the question is, how do you incentivize? What's the role for government to, to fund the R&D? Because what you want is you want them to make new drugs that are gonna fight these infections um, or new drugs that are gonna fight resistant bacteria. And you want no one to ever use these drugs unless there's you know, a total emergency. So there's, uh, the business model for doing it is, is, is pretty poor. And I think there is a role for, for government. And you know, since we're talking global, there's a major role in terms of governments getting together and figuring out how are we going to provide for the countries mm -hmm. that can't provide for mm -hmm. themselves. The discussions during this pandemic, I think were, were, uh, they were occurring so late as to be absolutely meaningless. Because when you're in the middle of a pandemic is not when you can reach an agreement as to what percentage of, of global production is going to go uh, to, to the world. Will it be how will you distribute scarce resources? And it, it pulls in a lot of really important ethical issues mm -hmm. that you know, the WHO is trying to deal with, but you know, can only deal with through you know, trying to influence rather than anything stronger. I, I think that was exactly the same story in, in the UK, and we bought antivirals from two people, um, only two companies, and that actually made the contract negotiations pretty difficult um, in, in terms of the deal you got and so on. So I think government does need to play a stronger role in this. I wonder if I can just pick up on the last point, Reggie, if I can, and just mm -hmm. sort of widen it out to, to, to the point that um, of, um, uh, was it about five years ago that in Indonesia, that Indonesia wasn't prepared to provide um, uh, some of the uh, genetic material um, which was necessary for the development of vaccines because they were going to be developing vaccines for rich people in rich countries and not for Indonesia. And I just wonder whether colleagues have a... And I think that's still not yet resolved. I think that's still a, a standoff and a sort of understandable standoff if you look at it from the Indonesian point of view of, of you know, they, they're providing material but not actually getting the benefit from... Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was an issue while I was at CDC of you know, mm. why, why share a viral strain that's going to go to manufacture a vaccine that won't come back to, to your country? 
How do you, do we have the systems in place at the global level to help negotiate these relationships? Because without open sharing, uh, uh, there's no way that we're going to be able to prevent future pandemics or respond quickly to, to those that are emerging. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the trust issue translated into an issue of ethics. And how yeah. do we manage it? And at a global priority. scale. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the question mm -hmm. here. Um, is, I come out of the financial services arena, and this is eerily, scarily familiar in terms of uh, the uh, contagion issue. And clearly where we failed there was we did not have, I believe we still don't have, the right degree of ongoing public discourse about the risk continuum that we face. You know, low probability, high impact, and more sort of uh, moderate impact absolutely high probability diabetes, et cetera. How do we encourage that kind of discourse both within countries and between countries on a continuous basis? Wow, it's, it's really hard. You know, for, for about three to four year period in this country, there was major efforts to prepare for a pandemic of bird flu. And uh, Secretary Levitt went around and did a summit in every state to try and pull together and have that discourse and pull together uh, various sectors, public, private, nonprofit, uh, um, to do that kind of planning. And people tend to burn out and uh, pretty quickly. Um, you know, even now, after a pandemic, there's a sense of complacency. People don't want to talk about it. Uh, the issue of terrorism. Uh, I went to Israel to try and learn from their experience there. And how can you be so prepared? And they say, because we face this every day and events happen every day. Uh, the kind of things we're talking about, about pandemics, um, aren't happening every day. They're happening pretty frequently and, and, and probably with increasing frequency. But it's, it is very hard to engage people on this. I can bring almost any dinner party to a screeching halt uh, with some of the conversation about, about this kind of stuff. People don't want to want to go there. And it's an interesting parallel with the financial industry, isn't it, as, as, as you say? And the sort of point of not making a good, not letting, what is the expression, not letting a good crisis go to waste? You know? Exactly. That actually that's the moment when you actually that's... need to, to do something in an incredibly risky business like, like yours, right. <laughs> let alone the one, the, the, the one that we're talking about. Um, because it is about keeping up momentum, isn't it? Um, uh, uh, and. Uh, and I, I guess I'm in exactly the same position, that, that unless you're able to have something that is going to be relevant to people on a very regular basis, when it does occur, you just have to be much more decisive um, uh, uh, about it. I think there's a, a challenge, which is that we, and again, parallel to the you know, financial industry, which is that we face um, broad systemic risk. And you know, part of the challenge to that is to, um, you know, from my perspective, we have a, what I like to think of as a sort of disease du jour mentality. It's always about, okay, this is, this week it's H5N1, next week it's H1N1, you know, a decade ago it was HIV. And what we need to do is to establish um, the capacity to look at pandemics in a preventative way which transcends what particular pandemic it is. And it's about finding what are the commonalities. Oh, look, these all came from animals. That's interesting. They're not evenly distributed about where in the world they come from. And I think it's facilitating sort of research and development and early detection and all of the sorts of things that need to go in that. In the same way that, you know, in the financial systems, I'm not sure exactly what the parallels are, but it's about sort of what are the, understanding what are the systemic risks fundamentally, not what was one particular one. It's not about mortgages. It's about you know, something which goes beyond that. And, and I think that, I mean, I think we have a hard time. We're very good as, at humans at seeing something happen and responding to it. We're much less good at thinking about probability and thinking about what's gonna happen in the future and preparing for things that are obviously gonna happen. There will be a pandemic. There will be a pandemic which is as transmissible as H1N1 and more deadly. Um, and just to have it be H1N1, okay, and that was too much of a risk, and now we're moving on. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, let, let me have one point, which I think we're missing a trick here, which is linking this discussion with the discussion about aid and development. Hmm. Um, because it is, uh, you know, if we take the route which Nathan is, and I'm sure we all agree with, of, of trying to get in early, actually the key is poor 
weak health systems locally, poor systems at governmental level, and all the rest of it. And, and we're not, we, we are still, I think, quite often in our mentality about aid and development is doing things for other people. Um, actually, we're in a joined up world. My own personal belief is there's an awful lot we as rich countries can learn in health from poorer countries um, in an awful lot of ways. But I think there's also an awful lot that joins us up. And I, and I think this linkage, I don't think has been made in the UK properly between the development activity and pandemic. And I don't know whether, whether it has in the, in, in the US. I mean, I could comment on one particular mm. element of that, which for me doesn't sound particularly connected, which is the wildlife trade. Okay, so one of the things we find is all of these pandemics are ultimately things that derive from animals. Okay, and so, and many of them derive ultimately from wild animals. Okay, and yet, and so, so we know that retroviruses like HIV emerge through the hunting of primates in Central Africa. Okay, and we also know that these are not sustainable sources of food for people that live in Central Africa who are dependent on wild game. Okay, and we know that, you know, this creates a disaster for food security, it creates potential for future pandemics. Um, you know, from a conservation perspective, it's also a disaster. And yet, this is the really, these are the hard choices. Do we go into Central Africa and do we say, how do we address Central African poverty? Because that's one, gonna be one of the root causes to a lot of these, or poverty in general. Are we gonna really devote energy to go in and find alternative sources of animal protein? And that's a long slog, and it's a hard project to do. And it's, it's also perfect tragedy of the commons. It's like one of these situations, mm -hmm. oh, we don't want to lose chimpanzees, our closest relatives, off the face of the planet, and in the meantime, get a pandemic while that's going on. Okay, but but it's not the you know you can't point to some Central African hunter who basically is just looking to provide enough caloric intake for this family as being the fault of that issue. You know, basically, we're all going to have to take responsibility as a global community to do hard things if we're going to address these. And I think again, going back to this, the you know financial issues. It's, it's hard work on everybody's part of like things that are really fundamental that we know don't spend way more than you have. You know, duh, that's gonna lead to a major problem. You know, don't, you know, find ways to control the, the way that viruses are entering into humanity. I think that some of the answers are out there and to a certain extent for me it's like policy and are we willing to do the hard things, address poverty, for example. There was a question there. I guess my question is, um, you, you mentioned don't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, but the idea is probably don't create a bad crisis when it's not necessary. Um, I'm sure that you become aware of a lot more potential pandemics than we as news readers become aware of. And where do you draw the line between defining what is ready to go out to the public and is worthy to alert the public of, but not cry wolf too many times where the public won't respond? Richard, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, it's always an issue. I, I think, though, that too often government errs on the side of paternalism and of not sharing information that's, that's known. Uh, with the feeling that people can't understand it or, or uh, we don't know enough. Uh, I think that one of, the, one of the values of the response in this pandemic early on was the establishment of trust by sharing information that we have. Um, and you know, early on, it's like you don't know if it's a pandemic. It's got pandemic potential. And then as it developed, it, it was a pandemic. Uh, but I mean, outbreaks occur all the time, and they don't cause panic. And there's this, this false belief that sharing of information leads to panic. And, and that's, that's been shown time and time again. That's not what occurs. You know, there, there's a sense of, uh, you know, if you can empower people with things that they can do during a crisis, rather than causing panic, it, it gives a, a sense of trust and, and uh, that we will we'll get, get through that. You know, there, there were criticisms out there that, that this was drummed up. And, you know, I think that that is... Uh, a bunch of hooey. Um, I, I, I don't think that there was any aspect of this that was that was drummed up. I think that some of the communication around vaccination, uh, as it went on, uh, hmm. uh, by some people was was a little over the top, in terms of 
what the true risks were to an individual and the benefits. Um, you know, I got vaccinated, my kids got vaccinated, um, but that was a choice we made knowing where we were in terms of, of risk groups. And I think that you need to tell people uh, what you know in, t in terms of that and let them, let them make, make a choice. But I don't, I don't think that this was drummed up in terms of, of information uh, and knowledge. Um, in terms of don't let a good crisis go to waste, um, what, what the Israelis have shown is they have on their shelf ready to go public service announcements uh, when it, on all different types of topics. So for instance here, when there's a hurricane, you know, we just had a hurricane a week ago, well, that's when you should be going out to people and hitting them with the communication messages mm -hmm. about, do you have a communication plan? Do you have an evacu evacuation plan? Do you know the routes out of your community? Do you have four-day supply of water? Those kinds of things. That's what you mean by don't let a good crisis go, go to waste. But uh, you will destroy trust faster than anything if you manufacture uh, an event. Uh, mm -hmm. Just something, something to add, which is I think it's a really, I mean, a central question. And just a slightly different take, I completely agree with um, with those points, but um, the other thing is we should not give up scientifically, right? There, we have incredible capacity to answer very complicated scientific questions, and we should be a lot better at being able to take a virus and within the first, you know, couple of dozen cases and the first hundreds of cases, be able to calculate some of the key features of the epidemiology of it, get a sense of where it's likely to move in terms of how deadly it's gonna be. We're not there by any means, but this is a science which is in its infancy, and I think we can get there. And I think you know we have to try to get there. Okay, I think we have five more minutes, so I'm going to take this question here, and then I'm going to ask each of the panelists to share with us the things you want us to remember out of this discussion this evening. You all have made some interesting comments about the importance of communication and perhaps ways of improving communication. But one thing that hasn't been addressed is the role of the media. So I'm curious as to all of your thoughts, perhaps maybe beginning with Dr. Besser, on how the media handled this and what they maybe did well and maybe didn't do so well. I mean, for me, it's been really fascinating switching seats uh, <laughs> and going from being in front of the cameras, answering questions from the media, to being the media asking, asking the questions. Um, and one of the things that, that, that uh, I thought the media did really well with this pandemic, um, there was a, a large cadre of science reporters who, uh, and this is the US experience, who camped out at CDC and were there every day for the press briefings. A lot of them had done fellowships, in, uh, 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 night fellowships um, at the CDC. They understood public health. They were smart reporters. Uh, there, uh, there was a Canadian reporter. There were several in the U.S. Who were, who were very good. And they were asking really smart, intelligent questions. What we're seeing now, um, and we've been seeing over years, though, is that a lot of newspapers and a lot of media outlets have been getting rid of uh, their science reporters, people who have any technical skill in that area, uh, as, as print media in particular has been, been circling the drain. And I think that that's going to be a big problem uh, in, in future events, because having a media who understands it, who has scientific literacy, who has risk literacy, who can help <clears throat> translate uh, what's going on to the general public is, um, is, is very important. Uh, <clears throat> my observation in the UK is there wasn't a, uh, it, that it worked quite well, actually. Um, though I do take this point about the difference between science correspondence and political correspondence. And when things become a political story as opposed to a scientific story, you've then got a, yeah. uh, you've then got a bigger difficulty in terms, of, in, in terms of communication. But that's also about, frankly, the skill that government have of understanding what the media needs um, and being willing to be answering their questions almost before they're asking them um, and, and recognizing their deadlines and everything else. And, and my time in government, which was um, from 2000 to 2006, I think we got a lot smarter about understanding how to work effectively with the media on these, on these sort of issues, because it is a two-way thing um, uh, 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 around that. But in general, on this occasion, it was OK. But you can imagine that if it had gone further and you were getting into significant numbers of deaths and so on, I suspect we'd have got into territory that might not have worked so well and where you'd have got into a lot of 
uh, in, in the heat of the moment blame as opposed to what we've got now, which is some recriminations afterwards about was this all, you know, too much effort about um, too little. Mm. Parting words of wisdom. You want to start us, Nathan? Sure. Um, I, I guess... I guess what I would say is it's very easy at any one moment in history to sort of think that we are at the state of the art and there's no way to get better than this. But all we have to do is to look back into history to think of how different we are right now than where we were 10 years ago. Think of how information technology is. And I would just translate that to thinking about pandemics. I don't think that we need to be sort of have this sort of um, this reticence, this notion that these things are inevitable, that we are forced to have them. I think we should be envisioning a world in which we um, control and stop the vast majority of pandemics before they reach the point where we have to think about vaccines or media or having to deal with sort of uh, risk perceptions in the general population. I think we need to move forward with a bold scientific agenda. I think we need to move forward with uh, innovative public health agendas to detect these things early. Uh, and to reach a point where we'll look back and say the same sort of thing that we say with regards to cardiology, which is that the notion that the best way to approach this is just to you know, wait for a heart attack and then somehow treat it is absurd. Uh, and I, I, I think when people look back on this period of time, they will, you know, my hope is and my belief is that, that we will reach that point. And I think we all should sort of be optimistic and push forward towards that. My single message is the one about interdependence, actually. Uh, and, and it's the sort of points that, that, that Nathan's be making uh, and, and the sharing of resources because it is in all of our interests to do that. My question at the end actually is, what, is one that Richard said right at the beginning, which is somebody saying to him something like, um, uh, why do we concentrate so much effort on highly unlikely events and not enough on some quite likely events? And if you look at global health issues, um, we spend a lot of time on, on some of these highly unlikely events, but actually poverty and, and, and some of the epidemics we've got at the moment of diabetes and the sort of lifestyle diseases um, aren't getting enough attention. Exactly. Exactly. Sorry, I had two. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. Then I'll have two. Uh, <laughs> well done. I, th I think that uh, one of the things I hope people take away is, is the importance of having sustainable public health systems if we're going to be able to respond to the health problems of our day as, as well as pandemics. And, um, you know, I think that there is, uh, it's very easy for, for Congress um, to decide not to put money into our public health system because it's something you don't see except in an, in an emergency. Uh, investments in science, the same thing, you don't see them until a pandemic or another event comes and you wonder why you don't have something better faster. Um, and so I think that uh, there's a lot that we can do as, as a public to demand those investments uh, and, and say that we do put value in them um, and that they, they need, we need to continue that funding because the public health system in this country is teetering on the edge of, of collapse. Uh, and if you look at the public health system around the world, and again, into the whole issue of interdependency, we have a vested interest uh, uh, for our own good in having strong health and public health systems around the globe, as well as the moral and ethical obligation to help support uh, uh, countries around the, the, the world that are, are resource poor. Good. Well, I'll exercise moderator's license and actually offer up something myself. And it's actually quite simple. Each of us have a role in preparing for pandemics, all of us, as individual citizens, as members of a corporation, and whatever institutions we represent. So if we take our role serious, then perhaps we can make a change happen, as opposed to hearing this, having an interesting discussion, and then expecting the government, expecting the corporations, expecting someone else to drive it. There's a role that we all play, and we should play it. So I thank the audience for your participation, for your attendance, and your questions. And please join me in thanking our panelists for their insight. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We have classes dismissed. <laughs>